I was praying about what to, what to share here tonight, and, uh, and at first it was just a real s- struggle at first. I didn't really have anything. I was like, I felt like where I was at reading personally, the Lord was just like, nope. And then some other stuff that I had read over the weekend, um, nope. Uh, stuff that I had read just like yesterday, nope. So um, I just felt that uh, he led me in a certain direction here, so I'm just going to share. You know, with the new year, um, really with every new day, there's, there's new challenges. We need to have a, a perspective that's renewed in the Lord. And I was just thinking that a renewed, eternal perspective is what, what I need, you know, but I believe we all need that, a renewed, eternal perspective. And that perspective is rooted and grounded in the Lord. So just going to go over, I'm going to be jumping around in the Scripture so uh, you don't have to go to each and every scripture or anything like that, or maybe you can take notes, or um, that's up to you, but uh, I'm, I'm not taking like one text and sticking into it. I'm just going with a couple different subjects in regards to what's important to have a renewed eternal perspective. And when Pastor Josh was leading worship a few minutes ago, you know, he stopped and, you know, had asked, you know, to, you can verbalize it, you know, out loud or just in our hearts before the Lord, you know, things that we acknowledge just our dependency upon God. We need to, and that's part of a perspective for eternity is real, realizing just how much we really need the Lord in every area. So the first point here is we need the power of of the Holy Spirit. That's number one. In order to have that renewed perspective, eternal perspective, what God would ha- want us to have, because these things go by quickly. So I mentioned like this year, it seemed like, boom, 2020, we're already 15 days into it. Be like a couple blinks of the eye, and before we know it, we'll be summertime, and it'll be towards the end of the year, those type of things, and it, it just goes by quickly. And the Lord wants us to be focused where we're at now. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. God is an awesome God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 7, it says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, verse 9, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. That verse right there, verse 9 there, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, is, is one of those verses that's just stuck you know, in my heart, because I had an experience going way back when I first got saved. I used to visit this nursing home. It was on uh, 34th Street and 54th Avenue North. This is going back like 1997, a long time ago. And me and a good friend of mine, great brother in the Lord, buddy Paul Nygaard, used to go there pretty often. And we knew a lot of the people there. And yet we had gone there and Amazing opportunities, actually, to share Christ there. But we went there one late Saturday afternoon, and there was a gentleman there. And he was by right by the front door, so he was like, boom, right where we were when we walked in, he was right there. And so we started talking to him. And we started talking about the Lord, but very soon we we noticed something just radically different about this gentleman. I mean, this guy was, you want to talk about filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, this man was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. In a, in a place like that, these nursing homes, there isn't a lot of, a lot of joy. You know, there isn't a lot of, uh, you don't see that. 
There's some believers there, and they had joy, but this was just different. I mean, this guy was just overflowing with the Lord, and he was talking to us. Forget about us trying to minister to him. He was just ministering to us. It was amazing. And then he, he shared this verse, and he said it. And when he said that verse, I has not seen, nor you heard, neither has entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Man, it was just like heaven was talking. Me and my friend Paul, we looked at each other, man, and like our hair standing on end. Just like the Spirit of God was just present there. It was amazing. And this guy's name was Donald Blyde. I won't ever forget it. And we stayed there, talked to him for a while longer. But this guy was just like, it was like he was like <laughs> ready for eternity because he was just so filled with God, like he didn't even need to be here no more, it seemed like. And we went there the next week, like four or five days later, we couldn't find him. He wasn't, we couldn't find him anywhere. And we were asking about him, and, and nobody knew, like, what are you talking about? But there were some workers there that weren't there before, so nobody could know what was going on. And so me and my friend Paul were like, man, like, was that like an, an angel or something? Like it said in the scripture, did we just meet one or something? And so that's what we were thinking for like a week until we kept inquiring and then found out that indeed, uh, that gentleman, Donald, Donald Blood, he passed away that night. Like just a couple hours after we left. Just amazing. But it made me, it stuck in my, my mind and my heart whenever I come upon that scripture. Like, man, that's an eternal perspective. You know, this is the God that, we're, that we have the privilege of serving. He pulled us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the things that he has prepared for us, Man, we limit him too much. I limit him too much. God's just amazing. Verse 10, it says, But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. God has given us for those who have trusted Christ and received his gift of salvation, the indwelling Holy Spirit, and he doesn't just give us that, but he desires to fill us, to fill us with his power. Verse 11, for what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Freely. God gives us things freely. That's just, man. Which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And the Bible interprets the Bible. Verse 14, but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. In 2 Timothy 1.7 it says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Of power, love, and of a sound mind. We need more of the power of the Holy Spirit. I need more of the power of the Holy Spirit. When I was thinking about how I need to be renewed with an eternal perspective, I was thinking all the things that we need, that I need more of. And the more I started thinking about it, I just started to think about lack. Like, man, I just have a lack of this. I need more of that. I need more of this. And it all has to do with just more of God. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit. That's where it all starts. But we need humility. The last verse there in 1 Corinthians 2 says that we have the mind of Christ. Well, that mind of Christ in Philippians chapter 2 you know, in our, in our Savior, 
we have the greatest example of humility. Philippians 2, starting in verse 2, the Apostle Paul speaking here says, Fulfill you my joy that you may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. And when we're of one accord and of one mind, filled with the Spirit of God, man, there, there's, man, there's just great power in that. And you see that in the Word of God. These are things that God desires for us. It doesn't stop there. Verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. According to the Word, one of the, the greatest ways to walk in humility is just in our minds. Just think, you know, this person, I, I esteem them better than myself. And when we do that, that rips away selfishness. When we're considering others, it rips away selfishness. It does. And the problems that we, that I, can magnify in my mind and in my life and in my heart can be a barrier to doing the things and accomplishing the will of God. But when we think about others better than ourselves, God does an amazing work through that. Because that is the mind of Christ. Because it says... Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. See, God has created us, but he's created us to be relational first with him and then with one another. And that's the body of Christ, and that's the way he desires it. He desires for us to have to work through conflicts and relationship things to, to be able to serve one another. Because there's going to be conflict. The reality is when you have relationships with people, if you have a very superficial relationship with somebody, oh, you can be really pleasant. You can smile and say, hey, what's up and how you doing and all that and then have pleasant conversations. But when you spend more time with people and the closer you get relationally with people, there is going to be conflicts. And it's always like, well, how are you going to deal with the conflicts? That determines so much in, in life, how we deal with the conflicts that God has given us instruction on how to do but when we look to Christ and the example of that and esteeming others better than ourselves, thinking on the things of others, man, that, that's power. There's great power in humility, you see. God resists the proud. Whenever we're walking in pride, who, who, can, who can raise, you know, yeah, I think everybody can raise their hand. Who can attest to the fact that when we walk in pride that God resists us? God resists us. We're just not accomplishing anything. Everything, things in life can be difficult anyway, but things are even more difficult because we're just filled with too much of ourselves. That's so easy to do because we all will have to struggle with pride until the day we leave this earth. We've got this flesh to contend with. The flesh will always want to glorify itself. The flesh will always want to feed itself. The flesh will always want to be lifted up. Told to crucify the flesh. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Humility. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need humility. We need wisdom. We need wisdom. I need wisdom. And, you know, the Word of God is our instruction book, but, man, it's, it's a living book, but when we read it, and we just see just how gracious God is, because He tells us when we lack wisdom, what does He ask, tell us to do? If any of you lack wisdom, ask for it. Ain't that great? He just says, come and ask me for it. And when it talked about freely giving, you know, God will freely give you that. When we don't, and we try to figure it out on our own, 
it, it becomes like a conundrum, like this thing that can't be solved. Ain't that something? It's after trying and trying to solve it on our own, or on my own, and failing and failing, and then finally I go, man, I can't do nothing about this. I can't solve this. I ain't got no, God, can you help me? Well, that should have been like the first thing I went to. We need wisdom. In James chapter 3, it says, verse 17, the wisdom that is from above. And this is how we know it's the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of the world. The contrast is given here in James. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. But the wisdom, <laughs> contrasting that with the wisdom that's not from God, it says that there's bitter envying and strife in your hearts. Glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So we know when we're walking in bitterness and strife and all those things, that the Word of God is clear where that, that, that type of thing comes from. You know? It's not from God. It's earthly, sensual, and devilish. In Proverbs 13, 20, you don't have to turn there, it says, he that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So in having a renewed eternal perspective, needing the power of the Holy Spirit, needing humility, needing this wisdom, part of that is making sure that you're not surrounding yourself with those that aren't wise. That those don't, that don't have a desire to serve God, that those that will pull you away from the things of God. Not that, because we're called to minister to all men. We're called to minister to those in some of the worst situations, to those who are in complete rebellion against God, as we were at one time. Yet, we're not called to be in close, intimate fellowship with them. We're not called to be companions with them in the, in the foolish things that, are, that they are doing. And the, the Word of God is just so clear. If you want to seek after God and seek wisdom, go to those and be around those that seek after God's wisdom. And they have some of God's wisdom. One of the greatest things is to do is sit and just listen to somebody that's older in the Lord and has great wisdom. You can learn so much and glean so much from that. But like so many things in the Word, it gives you the contrast of two different things, just like it said about the, the wisdom from above and the wisdom that's earthly, sensual, and devilish. Essentially, that's what you're going to get if you're a companion of, of fools or you're a companion of wise men. You're going to get the wisdom of God or you're going to get the wisdom of the world. The Lord desires for us to walk in wisdom. In Ephesians 5, starting in verse 8, it's going to mention about wisdom, and it's going to be mentioned about being filled with the Spirit as well at the end. For you were sometimes, starting in verse 8, Ephesians 5, for you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. <clears throat> and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by this light. For whatsoever does make manifest is light. Wherefore, he, he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, or carefully, 
and not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. When Paul gives that contrast right there to being drunk with wine, there's excess. Then he contrasts that with the Spirit. God desires us to fill us, fill us so much that it's, it's like overflowing. There's an excess of it. It's overflowing. We're overwhelmed with it. But that can only be like the preceding verses there if we're doing the things that the Scripture says there and, and walking as wise. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need humility. We need wisdom. And we need to encourage and help one another. Hebrews 10 Start in verse uh, 21. It says, Hebrews 10, 21 says, Having a high priest, and having a high priest over the house of God, and that high priest is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. That's why we can hold fast to it. And let us consider one another to provoke or stir up unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Considering one another. To stir up. Provoke. We can pro- it's easy to provoke somebody. <laughs> provoke one another. But <clears throat> the Lord's encouragement here is to provoke one another to love and good works. We need one another. Hebrews 3, just another verse that and bears that out. It says in 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Hebrews 3, 13. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And the preceding verse that says that, it says take heed. That means listen up. There's a warning here. Brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And that's when it follows up by saying but exhort one another daily. Encourage one another. Encourage one another. We need to encourage one another. We're in a battle. We're in a war. It's a new year. It's a new day. But the war rages. And the war will continue to rage. The spiritual war. And in that, the more dependent we become, essentially the the weaker we realize we really are, the stronger we become. As soldiers for Christ, recognizing the need for the power of the Holy Spirit, recognizing the need for humility, recognizing our desperate need for wisdom, and recognizing the need for one another and to encourage and help one another. So as we go into a time of prayer here tonight... Josh, you want to come up? We go in a time of prayer here tonight. And knowing that we need a daily renewed perspective, pray that God would give us a renewed eternal perspective this year. Pray for one another that He'd fill 
each other with the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray that he'd speak to us to help us realize that we need to humble ourselves. Pray for wisdom, not just individually, but pray for wisdom as a body. Pray for wisdom for your brothers and sisters who are in difficult situations and they desperately need that wisdom. They desperately need that filling and power of the Holy Spirit to be able to walk through what God has put before them in their lives. And pray that God would just really just impact our hearts in such a way where we realize how much we need one another and to help one another to stir one another up to love and good works and when we put one another before the throne of God like that or not just people in this building we can have other people that we're thinking about in our lives people that need a renewed eternal perspective people that have allowed the wisdom of this world to overwhelm them and entrap them. We can cry out to God and intercede on their behalf. People that need to to see the marvelous light of Christ shine into their hearts. God would grant them repentance, loved ones, family members. There's so many, so many needs, so many requests that we can put before the throne of God. So much. But just like this word's a a living book, the Word of God's a living book. He's alive. God's alive. God desires to do new things in our lives this year. It's not like some New Year's resolution. No, the only resolution is to resolve to just depend more upon the grace of God. Paul instructed Timothy, he said, be strong in the grace Christ Jesus. I've been thinking a lot about that. Like, I just like, man, show me how I could be stronger in your grace, Lord. Please. I don't want to be strong in things that I think I'm strong in. Because that doesn't work out well at all. Show me how to become more dependent upon your grace. Because God's grace is meant to to be powerful, meant to sustain a man or woman through the most difficult things imaginable. And yeah, man, man, I desire to see just God to do just great and mighty things like the scripture talks about that we know not of. I mean, I, who desires to see more of God's Holy Spirit evidenced in, in our midst, in our lives personally and around others? Dude, man, we need that. Like, That's what makes you feel alive when you know Christ. Other than that, you know, yeah, we don't want to just go through no motions. We want to see God, like the power of God move. The living God. We don't want to just read about stuff. We want to live out stuff. And he, God desires to do that. Because it, it, just like that verse I read, Ephesians is talking about the the steadfastness, but because it says, because he's faithful. He's faithful. His promises are true. We're, we're not faithful. We, we can increase in being faithful, but overall, we're not. There's only one to look at that doesn't change, that doesn't move, that's always faithful, always merciful, always just, full of grace and truth. That's Jesus Christ.
Father, Lord, we just praise you tonight, Lord, and just thank you, Lord, that you are so merciful and are so merciful with us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, God, for doing what we couldn't do. We had no way, no way out of the darkness. No way. But you made a way through the light of the glorious gospel through your son and the sacrifice of your son. So we praise you for that, God. And God, I, I am. Lord, I'm, I'm admitting, God, Lord, that I need more the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. I lack it. Lord, I, I, I need <clears throat> more wisdom. I lack it. Lord, I need more humility. I, I lack it. And Lord, I, I need a heart filled more desiring to encourage and help and exhort others. I lack it. And God, I, I look forward to what you're going to do. I look forward to what you have. I thank you, Lord, that you're a rock. You can't be moved. And I thank you, God, that you don't take just a discouraged heart and just allow it to be smashed, but, Lord, you you come alongside by your Holy Spirit and you, you pick it back up kind of dust it off and strengthen it. I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do, Lord, and your people here. Because your word says, you who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. In Jesus' name.